begin transmission. Do fish know right from wrong? Probably not, but maybe. Uh, to, to be able to know right from wrong, you have to um, have quite a bit of intelligence. And intelligence is tightly coupled with sociality. There are several fish species that are highly social, and it's these fish that display the, the most intelligence. Particularly, I'm, uh, I'm particularly fascinated by one individual species, the, the cleaner wrasse. We talked about these uh, last time. These are fish that live in coral reefs and um, are protogynous, so the, in this case the, the largest um, fish, the largest individual in the community becomes male, and then there are usually lots of females um, around that he mates with. If he dies, then the second largest female transforms into male, and so on and so forth. So they have this, uh, this social unit, and um, so they have a kind of a biological incentive to be intelligent and cooperative, um, or I should say, they have an incentive to be cooperative, and cooperation usually um, uh, incentivizes intelligence. <clears throat> so these cleaner fish set up stations, and then client fish will come and get little parasites and dead skin cells um, cleaned by the, the cleaner fish. Well, remarkably, these, uh, these cleaners have the ability to recognize individual clients and uh, actually tend to prefer some clients over, over others. And uh, these, these clients remember the, uh, the fish, too. So they form this long-lasting relationship over many, many years, sometimes decades long. These are pretty uh, long-lived species. And it shows that they can recognize individual faces, individual um, species. So they have um, the ability to uh, recognize faces. And this might seem like a, a small thing. But to be able to do this, you kind of have to have some type of knowledge um, that you are something and that this is something else. So it's kind of a, um, a self-awareness. <clears throat> In fact, cleaner wrasse are the only fish so far who have passed the mirror test. So the mirror test is a, a classic um, test of self-awareness. And you put a pin little dot on the forehead of um, an animal and then stick it in front of a mirror. And if the animal uh, recognizes that it is a self and that what it's looking at is itself, then it will try to um, rub or scratch the dot off its forehead. So mammals, most mammals have passed this and, and many birds um, and the cleaner ras itself has passed this test. So it recognizes that it is, um, it is itself, which is pretty phenomenal level of intelligence. <clears throat> so, but getting back to right and wrong. So within this relationship that they form with their, their client fish, they can cheat. And so the, the rule is that if the, uh, the cleaner fish eats the dead skin and the parasites, then the fish don't eat the cleaner fish. And so you have a mutualistic uh, relationship there. But sometimes the cleaner fish will take a little bite of living tissue because that's a lot more um, nutritious. And um, this is cheating, the relationship. And the cleaner rats will be punished by, if it's a predator fish, then it can get eaten. Um, but usually it just kind of gets chased around and um, punished that way. Uh, remarkably, the cleaner fish will almost never cheat a predator. Um, if, they, if they do cheat, they're going to be cheating the, um, the herbivorous fish, which is uh, pretty intelligent, right? What's even more remarkable is that they have an almost um, code of conduct that the family groups operate under. And the, the largest um, uh, male is in charge of kind of keeping the peace and making sure everybody is operating according to the rules. So if there is a female cleaner wrasse who is cheating consistently, then not only does the client fish punish them, the rest of the community does as well with uh, the larger male leading the way. And if you don't learn from this, if you keep cheating, keep cheating, keep cheating, then you can get driven away from the community in general. And so really, um, the, these fish are um, basically as intelligent as this crew, right? What, what did we do with uh, Dr. Cordyceris? We punished him for, well, murdering is a little bit worse than cheating, but we shooed him away from the group. Um, so cleaner fish are, are really remarkably intelligent, and fish in general are a lot more intelligent than we often give them credit for. So today we'll learn, um, I think, nine different species. We can only cover a short group, but basically just um, just representatives of each of our class, class, uh, classes and subclasses. Let's provide some context for our discussion on fishes. 
right? We are in phylum chordata, so everything with a, with a notochord, and you guys should be familiar with the five hallmarks of phylum chordata, and you should know that not all vertebrates, or not all chordates are vertebrates. <clears throat> so um, the fish, though, are in subphylum vertebrata, and there are two distinct lineages within subphylum vertebrata, and the first one is um, infraphylum cyclostomata. So we got phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata, infraphylum cyclostomata. And the cyclostomates lack um, internal bones, they lack true ossification, they don't have jaws, and uh, there's two uh, primary lineages here that we need to be familiar with, the mixenes in class mixini. Um, these are hagfish, these are deep sea scavengers that rely on an acute sense of smell and touch to find um, a dead prey, which they then rip chunks of flesh off with their keratinized tongue. And they also secrete copious amounts of slime for protection. Here one gets bitten by a shark, which then just gags and leaves them alone. Hagfish is fine. So this is a really remarkable defense mechanism. And we've been studying the, the properties of this slime, and uh, the slime, if you put a bunch of hagfish in a bucket and then shake the bucket vigorously, they generate lots of slime. And then you can pull the slime out in uh, sheets. This slime has uh, really spectacular properties. Um, we're thinking we could probably make it into a biodegradable kind of plastic because it has a lot of similarities of plastic. So once solidified, um, it's, it's very plasticky. So uh, biodegradable plastics would be a fantastic use of um, hagfish slime. The other uh, major lineages within the cyclostomata is class Petromyzontida. Petromyzontida, petro means rock, um, and uh, myzon means sucker or latcher on or something like that. So these are the, the rock suckers, and they're named that because during breeding, the, uh, the, the female will latch onto a rock in this little nest that they made, and then the male will latch onto her, and then um, she will uh, lay eggs and he will fertilize them externally. So these also use their suckers to attach onto hosts, uh, usually fish, and then slurp their blood. So Petromyzon is a parasite, um, the, the freshwater lamprey. And if you recall, the Petromyzon is a um, anadromous, so an anadromous uh, species lives in the ocean as adults and then swims upstream to gravelly freshwater beds to lay eggs. So this is an anadromous species. And here you can see on the side um, several gill pores. So this is another distinctive between these and the chondrichthys, which have gill slits. So uh, gill pores versus gill slits, uh, parasite of fish. Now look at all those words up top there. We have phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata, infraphylum nathostomata, class chondrichthys, and subclass elasmobranchii. So the nathostomates, these are jawed, bony um, animals, and uh, natho means um, jawed, so like, like gnashing, think of that. So the nathostomates are the jawed animals. Chondrichthys are those with uh, cartilaginous os ossified skeleton, so they don't have a really true dense bone, but they have kind of an ossified cartil cartilage. And the elasmobranchs are the, the sharks and the, the skates and the rays, so they're going to have placoid scales and heterocircle tails. Um, Sferna is my favorite shark. These are hammerhead sharks. And they're solitary for most of the year, but they get together in these large aggregations for breeding. And just can be a really a phenomenal thing to see. So many sharks all at once. Their hammerheads are really distinctive. And if you look at a x-ray of them, you can see the ossified cartilage. Um, so they don't have true bones. You can see the, the, the eyes at the very ends. <clears throat> uh, just a very odd morphology. And I'm not precisely sure why. Uh, perhaps it just gives them a better range of vision as their head moves back and forth searching for prey. Maybe it's sexually selected. Maybe, you know, uh, hammerhead sharks just think white set eyes are sexy. Um, I, don't, I don't know for sure. But they're very interesting, unique looking animals. And they're, uh, they're mostly docile. They're not um, very aggressive. And so they're, um, I still wouldn't recommend swimming with a whole bunch of them, but they're 
as far as sharks go, they're, they're fairly non-aggressive. So that's Sferna, the hammerhead shark. Also in class Chondrichthys is subclass Holocephaly, and the Holocephalins are um, really s some remarkable creatures, um, especially some of the extinct ones. We talked about this in, in lecture. There are some extinct ones with really weird tentacles on their, um, on their dorsal fins, and also some that have little buzz saw teeth. The ones we have now are called um, chimera fish. Um, genus is chimera, so that makes it easy. They're sometimes called ratfish and dogfish and ghostfish. They have a lot of common names. They're rarely collected. They um, are usually solitary. Their anterior dorsal fin has a venomous spine that will, they will try to stab you with if you grab them too aggressively. And so you gotta watch out for that. I want to point out this amazingly, um, this, uh, this uh, very easy to identify lateral line system. So this these gold lines on its face is the lateral line system, and if you recall, that that system is a sensory system, primarily used in detecting sub frequency vibrations from prey or predator. So um, vibrations through through the water. Um, I should also remind you of the ampullae of Lorenzini that sharks have that are used for detecting electrical currents. <clears throat> um, I forgot to mention that with uh, hammerheads. So know what the lateral line system does, um, vibrations, and ampullae of Lorenzini which, do, uh, which detects electrical currents. The, um, this chimera fish in sexually mature males, if you look at this guy here, it has this weird little thing on its forehead with denticles on it, which is familiar, right? Um, there's something going on with the holocephalins and nobody is quite sure what they're up to, but these weird little protuberances on their forehead that only occurs in sexually mature males. So it seems like it has something to do with mating or something to do with sexual selection, but Nobody, nobody knows why or, or, or what specifically. Some people speculate that it helps the, the male hold onto the female during sex. That seems um, un, you know, a stretch to be sure. Um, and it also seems a stretch that it would be sexually selected trait. It's not really obvious. It doesn't really do anything. It's not colorful or anything. So it's, it's an oddity for sure. But um, they have these little weird tentacle protuberances on their foreheads. All right, in class Actinopterygii, we're gonna have two subclasses, the Chondrostii and the, the Neopterygian. And um, if you recall, the differences between these, the Chondrostii are gonna have ganoid scales, so this, this heavy, dermal, bony, plated, interlocking scales. Um, the, uh, the Chondrostii are slow-moving, really fairly large fish, the paddlefish and the sturgeons. This one here, um, Asa Pincer, is a sturgeon. This one's a little baby, pretty adorable. It's got four little barbels that it uses to detect prey moving in the murky water. And um, Asa Pincer, um, like creatures on Earth, went extinct because we hunted them for their eggs. They lay millions of eggs at a time, and we made caviar and um, charged a lot of money for them and people ate fish eggs um, and we drove them to extinction. So uh, this is a little bit of a sad story, but Ace Pincer is the white sturgeon, um, a pretty remarkable animal. Gets, uh, the, the adults can get almost 20 feet long, so they, they get pretty large. You have ganoid scales and um, they're not teleost, which you guys know what that is now. So that's subclass Chondrostii are representative of the um, Neopterygian fish that are like Chondrostian fish is Attractosteus. So if you remember, there are some exceptions to this Napomorphy rule within Neopterygii. The um, Neopterygii are typically teleost fish and they typically have cycloid, um, tenoid, or absent scales, but this alligator gar is an exception. This alligator gar, so if you recall, call, um, Teleos fish primarily eat by suction feeding. Well, this mouth, take a look at this mouth here. This is not a suction feeding mouth. This is a biting, grabbing, stabbing mouth. So that should be an easy indication that this is not a teleos fish. At the same time, if you look at its scales, you can kind of see that they're, they're heavy. 
plated bony scales, they're ganoid scales, and so the scales are also different. Um, there are other morphological features that unite it with the Neoporygians. Um, so it is a Neoporygian fish, but its attributes are very similar to the Chondrostii. So this is Atract osteus, the alligator gar, um, a freshwater ambush predator of other fish. A classic Neopterygian fish is um, uh, Salmo, the salmon, and salmon are pretty remarkable animals. Um, they are famous for their migration patterns. And this particular creature right here doesn't look like most salmons because this is a male uh, and it is in the bull phase. So this is a bull, a male bull salmon. And um, in the bull phase, the, the typical salmon transforms into this really bright red, humped, um, massive, jawed, intimidating fish. And um, they will fight for territory and mates. So during breeding season, the males transform from the streamlined, marine, um, fast swimming fish to this intimidating um, alpha male fish. So. The, this is another example of an anadromous lifestyle. So the adults live in the ocean and then they travel upstream to lay eggs. What is um, phenomenal about these animals is that they can remember where they were born. So they don't just wander randomly through the, um, the rivers and streams to find eggs. They can actually, we don't know precisely how, maybe it's chemicals, maybe it's landmarks, um, but somehow they are able to retrace their migration from when they were little babies back to where they were born, the same, uh, same river, the same stream, often the same bend in the, the river. Uh, really remarkable memory, and we have no idea really how this works because this is the only time they, um, uh, they visit this place. Uh, they will only breed once in their lifetime, and so they don't make, the, they don't, they don't make this journey multiple times. So usually after they breed, they die. And this is a, also a really famous time of the year because there are thousands upon thousands of these salmon um, swimming upstream and predators get all they want and more until they just get so tired of eating, they just let the fish smack them in the face. So grizzly bears, um, bald eagles, wolves, um, everything prospers during the salmon run. And you can see there, that's the way the salmon normally looks. Very different than the bull salmon that you see here in its alpha male phase. Pretty remarkable creatures. So this is um, Salmo, the salmon, Pacific salmon in uh, subclass Neopterygii. In class Sarcopterygii, we have the lobe finned fishes, the coelacanths and the uh, lungfish. This one right here, Latimeria, is a coelacanth, and coelacanths live in um, deep sea lava tubes. So it's one of the one of the most remarkable places to live. Um, if you're a supervillain, um, which Latimeria maybe is, you know, you never know. They're very very rarely co collected um, deep sea lava tubes, and they have diphocircal tails, which is unique, and they have fleshy. Um, fat-filled uh, lobe fins, which they can kind of use to um, walk along the ground a little bit, and their swim bladders are filled with fat, which keeps them buoyant rather than air. Latimeria is famous for being a living fossil. They, uh, there are some fossils of Sarcopterygian fish like coelacanths, um, and then they disappear from the fossil record about 70 million years ago. And so there's a 70 million year gap between their fossil record and then when they appear um, virtually unchanged, which is just remarkable because in that 70 million years, um, according to conventional evolutionary time, um, all basically all of the mammals evolved and all of the modern birds evolved and all of the modern reptiles um, evolved, almost all of them. So all the, the diversity, uh, even flowering plants, flowering plants and insects um, in the last 65 million years have increased rapidly. So, but these guys, you know, just chugging along, doing see the can't stuff, not changing, not adapting, um, not really doing much except hanging out in lava tubes. Um, so a very unusual uh, living fossil. And I'll just remind you that the Sarcopterygii lineage is the lineage that um, conventionally speaking, gave rise to tetrapods and eventually us. So you are a sarcopterygian, phylogenetically speaking. 
And that's all we need to know. So there's just one major representative of every classification.